Hey, hello everybody. Welcome back. It's another episode of Ask Eddie and Ann. Ann Hawkins, Director of Communications for the Film Noir Foundation. And with a feline, you do have one feline in attendance, I see. Uh, yeah. Who is that? Uh, the ears look very they're vaguely angry, so I'm going with Charlotte. Oh, okay. You're not even sure. Okay, it's good. This is like the dark mirror with cats. You don't know which one is which, you know? Talked about getting them, like, you know how they had the big pins and that? Little collars with C and E on it. That, that'd be good. Actually, when when I had a cat sitter, I did put a pink collar on Emily so she would know not to approach Charlotte. Or she called uh, her the mean one. So, yeah, I've actually had to do that when people cat sit for me. Not okay. Brendan, he knows them. All right, very good. Well, we'll see if you got if you got that right. If you called that one right, we'll see. We'll see. Okay, Anne, I hope you're doing well. We're yeah. ready to rock, right? Yeah, we're ready to rock. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I didn't put down the name of the first person. <laughs> Whoops, my oh, apologies. Well. Uh, they'll 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 let us know who they are when this airs. So please do. Uh, is there any chance that betrayed woman, women, sorry, is there any chance that betrayed women might be restored by the film noir foundation? I'm a big fan of Beverly Michaels. <laughs> uh, we are all big fans of Beverly Michaels. We are. Uh, at, at present. No, there is no plan to, uh, restore betrayed women. Um, not out of the question. I mean, it's a, it's always good to ask and put something on the radar. I know that that, that's kind of one of her movies that's sort of slipped between the cracks. And uh, yeah, it's a, you know, it, it's a women in, well, it's kind of a women in prison movie, but they bust out and, and Beverly leads the, the rampage. Uh, Damn, <laughs> so, sounds see, good. It's, it's good enough, right? I mean, what else do you need to know? What else do you need to know? So, um, the, the answer is not at present, but who knows? Uh, somewhere down the road that that could happen. Who knows? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Susan in Moscow, Tennessee um, said that there was an online discussion where the question was whether there were any film noirs about serial killers. Or that was a question or something that came up. Uh, I guess this was on some other discussion group yes. other than ours. Uh, and uh, Susan notes that a couple were mentioned, like Shadow of a Doubt and M and Night of the Hunter. But can we discuss others? That's kind of a interesting question. I'm, as you know, uh, and I am not the biggest fan of serial killer movies. That's like kind of not my thing. It is interesting when they are noirish rather than horror movies. Um. But I did notice I, that when I was doing um, Dark City, um, there was this, you know, I started writing about the Sniper and, mm -hmm. and other films like that that were kind of trend setting because they were early examples of serial killer movies, which of course, you know, 20 years down the road would become like a whole genre unto itself, but there weren't that many. It, but it's always it surprises me how one sneaks up because you didn't really think, oh, yeah, that's a serial killer movie like Shadow of a Doubt, which yeah. is a serial killer movie. Yeah. But but he doesn't kill anyone in the movie. Yeah. Right. You just know that he's capable of it and that's who he is and that he's done it before. But it because it doesn't really follow any of the. Uh, the tropes of the serial killer movie, you know, he's, he's not stalking well, a victim or anything like that in the film. He's just hiding out, you know? Yeah. And um, also it's kind of hard. We're not, I mean, I'm not sure that I really consider someone who murders for profit, a serial killer is sort of not the same thing. And he's like killing those women for money, not just to, you know, it's like the honeymoon killers. They're not really serial killers, even though they killed a number of people. Well, they're, I well, money. boy, you you must be a horror movie fan because you are <laughs> you are splitting hairs on like what constitutes a serial killer. I would say someone who kills a succession of people <laughs> it is, it is a, <laughs> motive or not. I'm going to be the I'm going to be the okay. tough prosecutor here, okay. right? Whatever their motive is, they're killing people in succession. 
but but it's interesting that I found, and I, I could be wrong about this because this is just an observational thing. I haven't really researched it, but you know, Hollywood was sort of, um, ser- it dealt with serial killers who were in all period films. It uh-huh. seemed like they, they would do Jack the Ripper and they would do all that stuff that serial killers were like on the loose in foggy old London town, Yeah, you know, in the lodger and, uh, you know, all, all the different versions of the lodger and sort of, um, you know, Hangover Square was kind of a serial killer movie, although he would black out and didn't, wasn't aware that he was doing it. But it was interesting because, you know, and obviously M, the original Fritz Lang's M, yeah. was sort of the first of its kind, I guess. I guess if somebody knows of an earlier serial killer yeah. movie than that, that would be interesting. But... um it wasn't really until the 50s that it they started to be made about contemporary uh killers you know mm-hmm. like the sniper and without warning mm-hmm. was like a low budget version of a guy you know a gardener who kills people with gardening shears and uh and then you just started seeing it a little more often you know but uh and, and then forget it because 20 25 years later it's just you know it's this explosion yeah um Anyway, so um, that's it. Interesting. Okay. Uh, this is from our friend Michael in Post Falls. I recently watched Shakedown, which had previously been shown at North City events, including this year in Seattle. The premise reminded me of the more recent film Nightcrawler, uh, where the main character tries to make a name for himself in journalism by nefarious means. The difference being Howard Duff played a photographer uh, and uh jake gillenhall plays a video cameraman i would love to hear your comments in comparison to the two films and whether the latter might have been influenced by the former you know i never put those two together really uh when i saw nightcrawler i didn't think about shakedown well you know that's because um well i i happen to know for a fact that um Dan Gilroy, who who wrote and directed Nightcrawler, uh, was inspired by Ouija. That he, uh, yeah. I read an interview with him where he said he he found this the book which I have around here somewhere. You know, Ouija's world. He found it in a used bookstore and was flipping through it, and that that was what gave him the inspiration for this uh, character. And then he actually, in researching it. I forget the names of the guys, but there were there were these two brothers who were actual night crawlers who would uh, drive around, you know, in, in a Crown Victoria with a police scanner at night in L.A. and be first on the scene when there was an accident or something. And and so his research certainly consisted of more than watching Shakedown, but uh, Ouija was also the inspiration for the original Shakedown, right? Made in 1950. Uh, And it was called The Magnificent Heel. And, you know, I don't know that I I have a great fondness for Ouija. And even though he certainly, uh, you know, skirted the rules when it came to proper journalism, you know, tampering with crime scenes and, you know, Put, throw the guy's hat in there. They like to see the guy's hat. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't. I don't think of him in a, as the magnificent heel or being particularly villainous in any way. But I would say that the major difference to me between um, Shakedown, made in 1950, and Nightcrawler, which I guess was made in 2015 or something like that, is that the world has changed so much that in the original movie, you'll recall that all the journalists at the newspapers where this guy was selling his Johnny on the spot news photographs uh, detested him because they thought he was so unscrupulous and unethical in the way he went about his job, right? I mean, you remember the movie, you know, he would would tell the woman in the burning building to hold it and, you know, turn to the left, the light's better and all. It's actually pretty funny. Um, But by the time Nightcrawler was made, 
the message of that movie was the the media is so corrupt that a true a sociopath can succeed brilliantly in that business uh because the guy was just psychotic his yeah. ambition and everything he, he was a, a a freak you know and uh i forget is the character's name that jill and all played lou lou something or other uh anyway so to me that was the biggest difference between those two movies they're very very similar i don't i don't believe that dan gilroy had seen shakedown it was not an easy movie to see huh. i can i can tell you this if he saw shakedown he saw it at noir city in yeah. hollywood right because that's that's the only place you would have seen it until its recent release on uh on blu-ray uh from kino i think throwing in a, a pitch for kino there uh so anyway and let's hear it for the for the gilroys huh i mean that that's quite a family of uh they don't they don't get talked about very much but you know frank gilroy was a great playwright and then his kids uh tony gilroy who did michael clayton and various other things and then dan gilroy who did nightcrawler and john gilroy who is a film editor who has edited i think both of those movies uh but yeah the the and i think dan and john are act are twins uh so and they're just i think they're just about my age um they, they've done some good good stuff so that's a that's a very talented family and and one of those guys did all the born movies which i'm going to tell you right now i've never seen a single one so, so I, that's just the way that goes anyway um but if people haven't seen nightcrawler i uh i i highly recommend it i think it's a really really good film it reminds me a little bit of uh of taxi driver as well and they certainly uh copied the poster <laughs> the the poster yeah. for nightcrawler yeah. of him with the video camera standing yeah. next to the car is exactly like the taxi driver poster with travis standing outside his uh, his checker cab yeah and, you're right and, yeah. yeah so uh, anyway they were they were definitely tipping their hand on that one um okay uh adam wants to know um two movies i really like that have come out in the last decade are drive and blade runner 2049 uh in adam's opinion these are both neo-noirs right what are your thoughts on these films and the lead actor in both which is a man by the name of ryan gosling yeah. and would you like to start this off um yeah i have not seen blade runner 2024 so i should put that out there um i had problems with drive um he mainly because he was just michael manning so hard that it was like a little distracting for me Ooh, Plus, nicholas nicholas reffin is gonna is oh he liked us before that uh, well, <laughs> i'm just uh, kidding i'm just kidding leader is one of my all-time favorite films now and also pusher two is yeah. an, another film of his i really like um with both featured moss mickelson um prominently in in those films um so yeah <laughs> no no so there you go um but i know this is like a really petty thing but it drove me nuts it's you know he's like this getaway driver mm -hmm. you know and he has like this really distinctive white jacket it just <laughs> distracted me yeah with, so this, much. with the scorpion with on the, the scorpion, back yeah. i was like do you have something even more identifiable you know you're supposed to be you know you're good doing point. something illegal so sorry but anyway but i thought the film was good i really did um especially i thought the way it depicted i like the way it depicted violence a lot um because i think it really showed how how terrible violence actually is which a lot of times does not happen and stuff so i i that was an aspect of the film and i thought ryan gosling was great i think he's a great actor i've liked him and everything i've seen him in yeah um Okay, I mean, I'll start there. I, I I'm also uh, I have no issues with Ryan Gosling. I know there's a lot of people that for some reason don't like him, really. or or well, I think what happens is like with Drive. I remember a lot of people just said, "Oh, you know, it's a Lee Marvin role, and he's no Lee Marvin." 
because, because you know he does he does kind of go through the movie in a way very similar to the way Lee Marvin uh, plays it in Point Blank. You know, he's just kind of zoned in, and nothing is going to phase him, and he can't be. But he has that whole relationship with the woman in the building. I mean, which yeah. is not Lee Marvinish in in the least. I mean, you needed an actor. No, and I no, and, and, and I, I like I, that he could play those two sides of the character. Sure, sure. You know, and I liked him in a, a place beyond the pines. I don't know if you saw that. That was not yet, I, but I want to see that. Yeah, I I thought that was a really good film. I thought it was very well done, and he's he's terrific in it. I have no problem with Ryan Gosling. I I think he's a very and I like the. Um, Weirdly, I like the other movie he made with Refn, um, uh, Only God Forgives, which is just a horrific film. I mean, it it is the most perverse movie in that it refuses to give the audience anything that it wants. Mm -hmm. It's just it's it's just a miserable, unpleasant experience, start to finish. But it's kind of cool. um and and i did like drive uh you know uh full confession i i um i know jim salas the guy who wrote the book a a little bit i've i've hung out with him a couple of times in arizona where he lives he's a he's a really good guy and a really really good writer i like his novels very very much uh drive was sort of a one-off standalone thing but all of Salas's books are terrific. He writes very, uh, very beautiful prose and does kind of noir novellas, and they're they're all pretty good. Uh, so I highly recommend that. And I thought that Reffin's direction was fantastic. I've sometimes watched, um, you know, just the first ten or fifteen minutes of the movie. I'll always watch just his first, uh, you know the driving scene where he's uh-huh. driving around downtown LA yeah. is just, is just so incredibly well done. I also have a good friend of mine in, uh, in Paris who runs a video did uh, ran wild side video and they, they published Blu-rays and DVDs, including my gun crazy book and, and uh, woman on the run and the prowler and these other things in France. And that they distributed that movie and that made them a ton of money drive was such a huge hit yeah. uh, especially in europe that um they it was good so that allowed them to publish some of my books so i'm all for that yeah and and all of that is by way of saying i haven't seen blade runner 2049 either okay <laughs> so we struck out on that one yeah that was a that was a strikeout i mean i i have a hard time um seeing that as as more noir than science fiction i mean obviously because uh i i shouldn't even speak about it because i haven't seen it and i don't really know what what the connection is between the two movies i don't i don't know yeah you know so but i mean between blade runner and and the sequel or prequel or whatever the hell it is i don't know yeah, and so, I just wanted to put a quick plug in for another Ryan Gosling film called Half Nelson, which is a fantastic movie. Um, and so people should should look for that. It's really great. And and just to be, you know, mildly controversial, uh, I could not get through La La Land. I, I didn't. I, I didn't couldn't, try. It looked I terrible. I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I mean, yeah. I did it at home, and I I really. I tried, but I got to tell you, as I get older, I am, I don't give movies the benefit, you know, it's just like, I, I don't see how these 20 minutes are going to, it's going to get any better. Can't do it. Okay. And I have a movie recommendation for you, Eddie, because I actually saw two, I have not done this forever. I saw two movies last night in the cinema, you know, because the showtime's lined up. God, it was so much fun. And you mean you went from one theater to the other? Yeah. Ah, right. I know I have not done that like in so long I'd forgotten like how much fun it was good for you yeah and um so I saw Pearl which is the prequel to X oh yes yes I which I haven't seen X yeah so each of Ty West's films has like a really distinctive style that kind of has to do with the material so like X is set in the 70s and it feels like a 70s film 
you know, so it's kind of what he does. He has another one set in the 80s that like you would think it was shot in the 80s. But so for Pearl, it's set in 1918, but it's like done in this classic Hollywood style. So it's sort of like if Douglas Sirk had made a film about <laughs> a woman coming to the realization that she's like a, a psychopath, but it is gorgeous. And the oh god the lead performance in it is the woman that plays pearl is just amazing and she executive produces the mia, film mia goth mia yeah goth. mia goth and she is like i mean she has a monologue in that and it was just sitting there when she got to the end of it it was like she needs which won't happen because it's a horror film she needs to be nominated for an Oscar oh yeah no nobody ever nobody ever wins anything for being in a horror film silence of the lambs is the only one who Oh yeah, you're right. I guess, and yeah. that's well, mainly because people refuse to acknowledge that it's it's a horror film. That it's Even a horror film. Well, because he Anthony Hopkins is face. in it. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty much a horror film. It's and horror since film. we're talking about serial killers and such, there you there you go. Uh, interesting. Well, I haven't seen either of those. I mean, since you know, I have to find something to watch that is. Uh, that my wife would also agree to watch. And those two movies are not. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. That's like when, when she goes off on business, then I can catch up on my horror movies and stuff like that, you know. So anyway, um, you now, number five. Uh, what's, okay, this is, uh, okay, I'll just do the whole thing. Uh, what sculptures are infamous in noir? Obviously, <laughs> there's the Maltese Falcon. The other one I thought of was, uh, Quan Lin from The Three Strangers. Are there others you can think of? Jessica Noren ended up in Savannah. P.S. They have two of Eddie's books at my college library. <laughs> okay, this has to, I know who this is. This is Jessica Cron, of course, who is a, a long time, long time listener, first time caller. Uh, <laughs> and, but she recently moved to Savannah. And yeah. uh, remember, she wrote in and said that she yeah. listened to the episodes on the drive. That was cool. Mm. And she's she's an artist, so this sense that she would ask an art related question. Um, okay, sculptures in noir. Okay, I'm gonna. Well, I immediately think of two uh, that figure prominently in the plots, but they're not Hollywood movies. They're um, from Latin America. One is Roberto Gavaldon's uh, The Kneeling Goddess. Uh, with Maria Felix, and the other is called The Naked Angel with Olga Zubri, who was in El Vampiro Negro, and that's by Hugo Carlos Christensen. And uh, yes, they both have to do with these women uh, modeling yeah. for for sculptures, and and you know they're pretty sexy movies. They're both made. I think one's 1946, and the other is 19. 19- 47 and i know that uh, olga zubri created quite a sensation by appearing uh semi-nude in this movie in 1946 um and maria felix creates a sensation every time she's in a movie uh so those are two i can also think of um uh, i remember the screaming mimi with anita oh, yeah. Yeah, where yeah. she plays the uh the burlesque performer but a sculpture of the screaming Mimi is a sculpture that's actually a significant part of the plot in that film. Um, so I'm trying to think of other ones because, you know, the, the, the uh, it's funny, the Quan Yin thing from Three Strangers, I don't think of that so much as a sculpture for some reason, nor do I think I like I wouldn't describe. How would you describe the Maltese Falcon? I know it's a it's a statuette. It's a, yeah, it's a it's a jewel encrusted statuette or something, you know. Yeah. Uh, are there any other ones that you can think of? I know we're missing a ton. Well, uh, am I? I mean, isn't there a sculpture in Phantom Lady? Yeah. Oh, of course, he's a sculptor. <laughs> he's a of sculptor. Course. Sorry, sir. There's a sculpture. Dumbass. In that. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Of course. His whole uh, French Oton's entire uh, apartment is like his studio, yeah, and there's all like, these. These modern sculptures with the one. the hands, you know, and the whole thing, and then there's the big, there's the big, um, there you go. the bust that he does where you see the hat at the end of the film right, when Ella right. Rains goes in, the hat is actually on the sculpture. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a good one. Good one, Anne. 
I, I totally spaced that out. And I know there are others. I can just see the actors playing at being a sculptor, you know, but I can't for the life of me. Uh, yeah, I'm, now, I'm, yeah, I have painters in my head. Like I can think all the painters really. Oh, usually, yeah. But yeah, I'm trying yeah, to think yeah. of the, sculpt the sculptors in that. Um, I, you know, that's, the, I mean, we, we both came up with one. Well, and then I had the, you know, the Argentinian film and the Mexican film. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. that's four. That's four. I that's think we did our job. That's that's a respectable. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, in your recent Ask Eddie session, you mentioned that you do not consider to have and have not to be a film noir. Well, uh, oh, this one didn't get a, a credit either, but... Um, while I think it's more of an action film, oh, some sorry guys. That's some books on film noir do include it on their list. That said, I was wondering what are your thoughts on another film that was more accurately based on the same Hemingway novel entitled The Breaking Point, starring one of my faves, John Garfield, and a young and vivacious Patricia Neal. Uh, I have the film and house it in the film noir section of my collection. Well, uh, that's good. Uh, and it says, since you didn't mention it, I was just wondering, well, I have mentioned The Breaking Point many a time. Uh, yeah. I love that movie. It is, I would say, the best adaptation of a Hemingway book. I would not say that it is a more accurate uh, version of the book. Um, nobody is going to shoot that book the way Hemingway wrote it, because it, it just doesn't amount so much I, I think he was drunk really when he wrote most of that book and and it's a lot of musings and not a lot happens i mean they're clearly the the smuggling the guy uh succumbing to a smuggling scheme is in the book and uh a, a, a certain thing happens to harry morgan i'm don't want to spoil it for people who haven't seen the film but that thing happens to him halfway through the book, and it's the end of the movie. Uh, anyway, um, I love the movie. I think it's it's one of the best. It's I agree. It's John Garfield's best performance. I might even argue it's Michael Curtiz's best film of the 1940s. And yes, I'm including Casablanca. Ah, let's be controversial. Um, in terms of the direction, I think the direction of the film is just spectacular. Everything about that movie is great. All the actors are great. Patricia Neal is great. Phyllis Thaxter is great. Uh, Wallace Ford is terrific. Juano Hernandez is is absolutely brilliant in that movie. So uh, th that's an A plus on my list. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's see. Da, da, da. Okay, and this is oh, this is for Michael. He got he got two <laughs> two questions in one episode. I usually try and space them out, uh, but he's talking about North City Magazine, so you know. <laughs> in the late <laughs> in the latest edition of North City Magazine, actually, this was the previous edition. Yeah, yeah, that's now, correct. We just we just released a new edition last right. week. Well, yeah. Um, so in the yeah, so in the latest edition of North City Magazine, the article about J.T. Walsh mentioned several of his movies, including Red Rock. Wait, have we already done this question? Red Rock West and the plane. No, I don't think so. Oh, okay. Oh, I, I, well, I don't know. Did we? Yeah, we did. I'm pretty sure we did this, this one already. Week, oh, okay. Okay. Um, well, oh, well, his question. Then we'll we'll abbreviate it we'll because abbreviate he it. the the just the thing was he'd heard that Red Rock West it never wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't going to get a distribution or anything. And then it, it ran for a while at a San Francisco theater. And he was asking what the theater was. And the theater was actually the Roxy. Roxy. It was right. the Roxy Theater in San Francisco that showed that. And, uh, and and that eventually led to the film getting a distribution deal and, and eventually led to uh, the latest issue of the Noir City magazine, Yes, which one. has a cover story on John Dahl, who directed Red Rock West, where uh, the Film Noir Foundation declares him a modern noir master, 
uh, based on Kill Me Again and Red Rock West and The Last Seduction and Joyride and several other really terrific movies that, unfortunately, John Dahl made in the early part of his career when he was still able to make feature films. You know, now a lot of these great directors that I loved in the 90s, you know, like John Dahl and Carl Franklin, uh, they mostly do television stuff now because it's it's next to impossible to get those types of movies released as feature films, right? So uh, um, not that they aren't working steadily and doing really good work, but you're just, they're doing it for, uh, you know, Ray Donovan and, uh, you know, House of House of Games. And is that what that's called? House of, what, what am I thinking of? What's the one that Kevin Spacey was in? Is that House of Cards? House, House of, of Games? Cards. House of Cards. Yeah. Okay. And I highly recommend the British, that was based on a British show, which is really incredible. And the books are good too. Okay. Oh. Um, and then how do they get North City Magazine, Eddie? Oh, there are so many ways that you can get the North City Magazine. If you sign up to the mailing list, that's part one. You, you go to the Film Noir Foundation website and you sign up for the mailing list. That way we know where to send your copy of the digital edition of the Noir City Magazine, which a $20 or more, or, or more, more, mind you, more. Uh, a $20 or more donation will then get you the digital edition of the magazine. Uh, it comes out at least three times a year. When we're good, we get it out four times a year. And you can also buy the print edition of the magazine from Amazon for fourteen ninety nine, of which we get a dollar ninety nine. It's your call. I say do both. Please. I say it's the sensible. <laughs> it's the only sensible thing to do please, is please do, do both. And you get the digital one first, so that digital one always comes out before the print yes. edition, just so people know. So you can get you get to read it first. Exactly. Exactly. So anyway, I'm happy. You know, and the the print editions are great. I don't mean to be negative about Amazon because they have figured out how to do this stuff and they do it extremely well. But the fact of the matter is, you know, they, they get to keep all the money. Um, so I, I would just do both. There you go. Then you can buy the annuals, which the new annual is out too. The new annual is out as well, which uh, has uh, Dana Delaney's great essay about uh, Gloria Graham. That's kind of the cover story of the annual. Any excuse to get a nice shot of Gloria Graham mm -hmm. on the front of the book is is great. But yeah, that that has just come out, and all of these things are coming out at once. It's very it's very yeah. good. It's like, like a big end of summer surprise. Here it all nice. is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and oh. also, since we're talking about things, <laughs> um, so this will air on the twenty second, which means that Detroit starts on the twenty third. Which means I will I will be uh probably in in Detroit uh when this is broadcast. So yes, and I will be there twenty third, twenty fourth, and twenty fifth of September at the Redford Theater. Uh, so I hope a lot of folks come out because, it, you know, it's interesting as we, uh, as we reacclimate, like you did last night, seeing two movies <laughs> out in public, uh, I'm hoping it has, it has been the case, uh, a couple of times so far when we've done a Noir City Festival, that it's been, um, a lot of people's initial return to, uh, the cinema you know, out in public. So uh, I hope we'll see a good, a good crowd uh, for these three days at, at the Redford. We're showing some really good stuff. I, I can't remember right now what it all is. I know one of them is a double bill of Nightmare Alley and The Spiritualist, yeah. which is pretty cool. So anyway, it's a uh, great fun will be had by all. And I'll personally say hi to everybody who shows up. And the sh you're showing your favorite film, In a Lonely Place. In a Lonely Place. That's our opening night film on Friday night. So come out and, and see if I have something new to say about that film. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. I promise I won't make anything up. Okay. So I think this one's yours. Eight. Okay. Uh, Bob wants to know, 
As a writer myself, I'm always fascinated by how other writers work. What's your writing setup slash process? Uh, and then he asked, you know, do you, do you keep a lot of notebooks? Do you keep a notebook in your pocket all the time, a planner, a journal? Uh, do I write longhand like Elroy on index cards? That's uh, on a typewriter, like the one that's sitting right there. Uh, or do I use a computer program? How do you go about writing and organizing your work? Um, anything that is available. <laughs> that's that's kind of how I operate. I can guarantee you that that is now pretty much a prop. <laughs> I, I use that for art things more. When I need to have something that looks like it was from a typewriter, I will type it out on that, but I don't write on that. Uh, my thing has always been, I tend to write fiction in longhand and everything else uh, in a word, you know, in a word processing program on a laptop. That's, that's pretty much it. And I do keep a lot of journals when I write uh, scripts. Any, anything that's like, like uh, the intros for Noir Alley and stuff like that, I will I'll take a day to like go through and and say, okay, these are the 14 movies I have to talk about. And then I'll, uh, like on the page, I will outline the stuff I want to talk about just to make sure I I have enough material in my head to do it. And then I'll, I'll do it um, in, you know, Microsoft Word or something. Uh, I will write that. But if I'm writing, you know, a short story, I will write in longhand. If I'm working on a novel or something, it, it will be nine times out of 10, it will be in longhand. So um, that's it. I mean, the nonfiction stuff, I pretty much just bang it out on a, you know, on a laptop. And how about you? When you do stuff, are you, is it all on the computer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, if I'm, I mean, I'll write out, like if I'm not, like if something comes to me, <laughs> I will write it like in my day planner or whatever, just to get it down and stuff. But I have like, I tend to work out my ideas in my mind because I walk a lot. Oh, yeah. So that's kind of where a lot of it. And luckily I retain that really well. I'm really fortunate that way. So it's not usually a problem for me to tap back in. Just you know, you know what I'm saying? Oh, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. So I, I don't really have, that's the nice thing is um i tend to re retain things easily so but sometimes if it's like a structure thing then yeah i'll write i'll write down like structural things like in in just my day planner yeah i mean if it's an idea i can retain it if it's a turn of phrase you have to write it down to remember it the way mm -hmm. it hit you or something um but it it's interesting as well because i don't I do consider, um, to, to me, I'm writing all the time. There, there's hardly a time when I'm not writing. Um, it, it, like you say, if I'm, if I'm walking, I'm working. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's as simple as that, because I don't just turn off my head. It's just, it's like you want to clear your head so you can get some fresh thoughts in there and things. Mm -hmm. But um and, and that's, you know, God bless my wife who, you know, in the, we've been together quite a while now. And early on, it was like, she didn't realize that me staring off into space is me working. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's like, no, I'm she goes, what are you doing? You're just loafing. And it's like, no, I'm actually thinking through this thing I have yeah. to write, you know? And I, so uh, that's interesting. But when people, ask you what's your writing process they mean how do you put it down not not what's your process for thinking of the thing no. but how do you actually put it down so yeah and i definitely am really big on just getting it down on the page and then i edit a lot yeah i mean I'll oh go, god yeah because you know that that to me is the real writing process is the editing part <laughs> yeah i've never been very good about uh you know just get it all on the page and then worry about rewriting it later. It's like, I always kind of rewrite as I go. It's not always the smartest thing to do, but, uh, 
but I, I will do that as well. Anyway, so, okay, thanks, Bob, for asking that question. Okay, we're on number, uh, I guess this is number, oh, boy, this is a long one. This is a long one. Uh, this is our friend Mike from Virginia, and uh, I hope that you are not tired of commenting on Audrey Totter, which I don't think we are. No, uh, I would I, I why as, would I be? Exactly. I am as a fan as well. I've seen her in a number of movies. In the vast majority of these, she played a romantic or sympathetic character. She was usually more loyal than she should have been. Here are my questions. So Okay. So we're going to just do one question at a time. Um, my impression of the unsuspected in The Postman Always Rings Twice is that she was probably not lovable, but more neutral and had only a relatively minor role. So this level of badness did not match Todd's <laughs> reputation. What was your take? <laughs> that's that's interesting. I, I get, I'm I trying to s figure out where Mike is coming from here, like that Audrey was like the bad girl but she did uh you know half the time she played you know the good characters certainly in high wall you know she's the savior she's robert taylor's savior in high wall and she certainly uh you know in the setup she's certainly a, a good person i i in the end suspected she's just kind of a a vixen you know <laughs> And, I, I would have used the word bitch, but well, yeah, yeah, but you know, but she's so good at that. And, oh, and, anyway, she's fantastic. And, and she looks the, so and, great in that dress. Oh my god, she's fantastic. Yes. And the um, the postman always rings twice. She's just flirty, mm -hmm. you know. The, I mean, the, she only has one scene. Yeah, and and she's just flirty, you know. Uh, obviously, that's not a femme fatale role or anything. But it certainly got her attention. Uh, that that was a big role for her, right? Because that was yeah. 1946, and and I don't know that she had been in pictures with, uh, you know, two big stars like that. And to play that scene with Garfield, even though it was so incredibly brief, there was more to that role that they cut out. Yeah. Uh, Audrey has told me tales about shooting the stuff because they. It, it, I, I forget how this came up. It was something I was talking about recently about the various versions of the postman and how um, they took the circus out of yeah. the 46 version, but it was originally in there because Audrey told me about shooting a scene with John Garfield at the circus where the cat, the big cat in the scene actually peed on Garfield uh, during one of the takes. And she said it was like, the most howlingly funny thing that ever happened to her on the set. <laughs> um, but needless to say, that didn't make it in the film. Okay, so uh, uh, number then, two yeah. question. Uh, I, it, the only awful person she has played in the movies that I have seen is the wife in Tension. Uh, but even then, she was vastly deeper and more interesting and far less the pure mindless evil and hatefulness of Ann Savage's character in Detour. Uh, so Mike is asking if Audrey's reputation is entirely from tension. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, not entirely, because Audrey did play the, the temptation. If, if not an evil character, she often played the temptress in these movies. And, but I, the thing about this question that is interesting to me is that I actually find the Audrey's character in tension, Claire Quimby, uh, far more, far nastier and more hateful than, than Anne's character in Detour. Yeah. Be because there is no, I mean, Anne plays it savagely and, mm -hmm. and ferociously. And you just, because of the setup of that movie, that they're trapped together. Yeah. That this man and woman are like in the car, then they're in the hotel, and, you know, and they're just fighting like cats and dogs Plus, the whole I, time. 
I think also Anne Savage's character, you can tell that she's had a hard fucking life. Oh, dude, absolutely. <laughs> my friend. Well, and she, you know and I mean? she, like, yeah. that has been a hard life and this is her chance to crawl out of it. And so, she's dying. And, and the character dying, is yeah. dying. She's dying in the movie. I mean, she's got yeah. the cough. She's got, yeah. she's got consumption, you know, and there's that, that line where he goes, oh, you mean like, uh, like Camille? And she goes, who's Camille? You know, who's that dame or something? You know, it's, that was a funny line they threw in. Uh, but I actually have some sympathy for Vera in Detour, where, whereas I have no sympathy for Claire Quimby in Tension. Yeah. She's, she's just rotten to the core. Yeah. Um, and, and then lastly, Mike asked about um, the end of the setup where, uh, you know, she says, you know, we both won tonight, yeah. you know um and mike wants to know if i thought if we thought that was appropriate for one of the great noir movies or did it did it seem a little over the top and it's optimism what what what's your take on this i saw you clutch your heart uh yeah no i i think because that film is really about the relationship i mean that's what's sort of amazing is that because it is like the greatest boxing film of all time and it really you know um depicts that um level of boxing and what that's like it's a lot like fat city in that way um which is another great boxing movie but to me the core what i like about that film is we spend so much time with her too you know when she's walking through the little town right. Right. by herself so and her wanting him to stop boxing because you know it's not great for your brain you know, yeah. uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a very harsh thing. And so for me, just having that at the end where she's sort of holding like the Pieta, you know, is just, yeah. So for, for me, it really worked because like I said, I felt that film is so much about the relationship. It's not just about him as a boxer. Yeah. I have no problem with that ending of the film. I, I know where Mike is coming from with this because I do think the dialogue is a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit over the top. Yeah. You know, we both won tonight and there, you know, and he's lying there with his hands broken and everything. It's a it's a little much. Uh but I agree completely with your assessment of the whole thing and how um how lucky the guy is that there's a woman waiting for him. Because mm -hmm. think of the think of that movie without that. And yeah. that's that's the as depressing as it could possibly be, right? So yeah um anyway that and audrey was cool in that she also told me great stories about making that film and uh you know how she really she liked robert ryan a lot and she really wanted to do the movie and uh you know once again howard hughes and all of his weirdness was like um you know not seeing it because he wanted some some you know babe to play the part not that audrey wasn't a babe but but that uh, wouldn't have worked for that role i mean of it's, course it's, not it's a of course marriage not. role it's not but it's funny because you know um I mean, uh, initially uh, robert robert uh robert wise wanted to cast joan blondell in that part that's that's who he saw as yeah. as uh you know I, I can't remember her name right now the character's name but uh but howard hughes rejected that because he you know women lost all interest for him when they passed a certain age and Joan Blondell 18. was past past that <laughs> age you know. well realistically that was his personal life Sorry. realistically it's more more like 28 or 29 then then you know the the sell by date had been reached and so um Audrey was was the only one that Wise and Hughes agreed upon that he like accepted that and yeah. and audrey uh just said you know i got the part because howard hughes thought my breasts were big enough that that's exactly <laughs> Whatever, what she whatever said. actress wants to hear <laughs> yeah yeah and and you know that was that was that so yeah. same as it ever was in hollywood right yeah. so anyway so mike we're all big audrey totter fans and uh you know uh there are other smaller roles in there where she played kind of not so great characters, but you're you're right. I mean, she 
she certainly played more good women than Marie Windsor played yeah. good women. I can't recall when Marie actually played, you know, a, a good character in a movie. Uh, anyway. All right. Well, I can think of one, but I don't want to spoil it. Okay. What, what's the one? Well, uh, narrow margin. Oh. Well, the narrow margin. Yeah. Well, it's a trick that she's yeah. good because she's kind of yes. nasty through the whole movie. And then it yeah. turns out, oh, wait, we were wrong. She's actually the good guy. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, should I just do this one? Uh, this is number 10. Yeah, should you I do 10 do because this? I'll do 11. Okay, very good. Uh, so Concrete Danny from St. Mary's County, Maryland, uh, is asking me to name my, my go-to cocktails for these film noir movies. And then he, he names three um, cocktails. Okay. But I'm going to um, use this opportunity to say that uh, you can actually now pre-order uh, Eddie Muller's Noir Bar, Cocktails Inspired by the World of Film Noir, is actually now up on Amazon. Uh, it, you can't get it until April 18th of 2023, but I saw that they listed it as a thing and I have it's it hasn't even gone to press yet but I've seen the whole book laid out and it's fantastic and it is 50 uh 50 cocktails matched with 50 movies uh and so concrete Danny wanted to know what I would uh drink with crisscross and with the asphalt jungle and with naked alibi uh, I have no idea on two of those, although for the Asphalt Jungle, the obvious choice, as you will see if you do end up purchasing a copy of this book, is a cocktail called The Left Hand. Uh, because, of course, in Asphalt Jungle, there's the great line about crime is just a left-handed form of human endeavor. So it made perfect sense uh, to have The Left Hand be the cocktail that goes with the Asphalt Jungle. Uh, as for crisscross and uh, naked alibi, I have to go back and think. Uh, obviously, naked alibi would be something with tequila or mezcal because it takes place across the border. Yeah. Um, and um, crisscross, I can't remember what they're drinking in that movie, but uh, obviously, there's the great bar with yeah, Percy Helton as the bartender. <laughs> Such a great bar. Yeah, Slim Slim's Roundup. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember what, um, oh, God, I can't remember the actress's name. Joan, Joan something, the bar fly who's oh, always hanging great. out at the end of the bar. Yeah, and she's, she's great. Yeah. And yeah. and I think at one point, doesn't she say about Burt Lang? She goes, geez, what a swell build. <laughs> I always love that expression when a guy has a swell build. Um, so that that's it. You got one out of me, Concrete Danny. The, the other ones like, I got to think about. For some reason, crisscross. I just think daiquiris. I don't know why. Um, daiquiris just feel like the one for crisscross. Like something that Yvonne DiCarlo might actually drink. Uh, yeah, I think that's why. Like I could see her drinking daiquiris. Like that would be her thing. She's not like she doesn't strike me as a whiskey girl. Well, you know, there's that 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 whole rumba thing they do. You know, that's, where she yeah. dances with Tony Curtis and Isai Morales and his band. And yeah, see daiquiris. Uh, a, da a daiquiri could go with that, or yeah. you know. Uh, but I, I have, when I did this book, I really, sometimes they just popped into my head. Like, this is obvious, you know, um, like, did you know that there was a Joan Blondell cocktail? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so a Mary Pickford cocktail too. I love Mary. Pickford. Oh yeah. There's a Mary a Pickford drink. cocktail. And, and, uh, anyway, I don't want to get too far into this because I just let the cat out of the bag. This is the first time I've even mentioned that there's a cocktail book on the way. You mentioned it and before. Oh, have I? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. good. I thought this was the first time. I lose track of these things. I got to stop drinking. Uh, anyway, um, so I don't know. But maybe if, maybe in a second edition, we'll include a crisscross and a naked alibi. I don't want to give too much away because I'll, I'll start talking and then it won't be, there won't be any surprises left when you get the book. So uh, there you I'm go. Sh I'm, I'm sure it will be beautiful. Oh, I cannot believe how great it looks. 
it, it's absolutely fantastic. This, uh, the designer's name is Paul Keppel. And he uh, is, is like the co-owner of this uh, great design studio in Philadelphia called Headcase Design. And he's, I'm, I just feel so lucky to have gotten him on this book because he used to work at Running Press, which is publishing the book, but now he's uh, out on his own. And he does stuff for J.J. Abrams and uh, uh, what, what's the guy who did Hamilton, uh, Miranda, uh, yeah. Lin-Manuel Miranda. Uh, he did, he's done all of the Hamilton tie-in stuff. He's yeah. designed all of that. He designed um, the secret history of Twin Peaks. Oh yeah, two, I have two that. Volumes. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, those, yeah. those yeah. are brilliantly designed yeah. books, but, you know, to look like FBI dossiers and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So I just feel so lucky that I got Paul to design this book. And it's, it's great fun because it's, we, we shot a little more than half of the cocktails in the book. We actually set up, you know, studio shots where I made the cocktails and we had like some, some kind of setting that tied it into the movie. Mm-hmm. And and then all kinds of other artwork and it's lots of fun anecdotal stories behind the films and stuff, uh, and it just looks spectacular. So yeah. there you go. Oh man! All right, here we go. Lightning round. Okay, so this is will it be on Nora Alley? <laughs> and your choices are already aired, scheduled, rights issue. <laughs> Not not noir. noir. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. This is uh, okay. Ready to go. Give okay, me the title. Sudden fear. Uh, highly probable. Highly probable that that will appear on Noir Alley. I would love to show that movie. Yes. And I have not. I have not shown it yet, but it is highly probable that it will appear. Okay. And he also asked just in general why TCM doesn't air that, but I would like to point out that TCM has had. The- aired that because i have it in my um my write-ups for the tv will stay in yeah <laughs> i know i put that in there multiple times but yeah I- well you know the thing I, I mean i'll say this again it's you know tcm does not own the films mm-hmm. even if the films are in a library that is ostensibly owned by tcm which is you know because tcm is now part of warner media discovery is the full name of the outfit now. And if it's a Warner Brothers film, or if it's an RKO film, or if it's an MGM film prior to 1950, the odds are it is accessible to TCM through the Warner library. Uh, That doesn't mean it's automatic. Yeah. uh, Because the the stuff still has to be worked out. It's like the right stuff. Anyway, so that's just, and, and then everything else, if it's Fox, that's now Disney. If it's uh, MGM later on, it's a it's somebody else. United Artists is somebody else. Universal is its own thing. Paramount's its own thing. Uh, and, and deals have to be made uh, to get packages of films that then can play on TCM for a set amount of time. So that's that's how these things work. Okay, let's let's move on. Uh, I was uh, a communist for the FBI. No, probably will not be screening anytime soon on Noir Alley. No. <laughs> Do you, you want to explain why, or are you just saying no? <laughs> I, I I I number. I don't really think it's a film noir. I mean, it's you know. Uh, I mean, I would show it as a special circumstance like you know we will be doing uh coming up next year there will be a special series on the blacklist oh okay and and you know it might it's gonna be a lot of film noir (laughs) it might it might pop up well there could be film noir there's also other there's plenty of other things and and also films that are about that you know later films that are about the subject uh but that's the absurdity of that movie uh the fact that it was nominated for an oscar for uh you know best documentary yeah, 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 yeah. 
it's 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 just so weird and i don't i don't anyway okay uh never open that door never open that door a film that we uh preserved we didn't actually restore it but we preserved it from argentina two cornell woolrich stories uh yes i would say once that has been digitally restored the odds of it appearing on noir alley are 100 percent okay uh death is a caress uh great question i would love to show that movie um, that's the Norwegian film made by Edith Karlmar in 1949, uh, which is a very unusual take on like the postman always rings twice. And I would love to show that. Uh, it obviously has not been shown. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how we would go about getting the rights to show it since as I, uh, people have heard me say, it's very different. The showing a film theatrically, a one-time screening, which I have done with that movie, yeah. is much, much easier than getting the rights to broadcast it on television. Because Mainly because the people know that it's going to be recorded and that the possibility exists that somebody is going to steal it and pirate it and sell it or something. So it's much stickier to get a movie shown, you know, broadcast on cable or, or streaming or something than it is to just show it in a, in a movie theater one time. That that's not difficult. Yeah. So and, and we'll just see to put in a quick plug to not just for North city, but for rep theaters in general. I mean, this is the kind of things that they show that, you know, yeah, you're not going to be able to stream it. So you need to like, go support your local cinema yeah if you have one. Ex exactly i know not everybody has that opportunity but if you do uh alias nick beal um i don't know <laughs> i think i showed it but i honestly cannot remember i know that it has shown on tcm and i would happily show that movie because i think it's a masterpiece such a great movie um but I'm not sure. No, I'm thinking about it because I did the audio commentary for it. I did the audio commentary for the Kino release of the film, which is why I'm thinking I talked about that movie so much. But it I don't wasn't think on, you've shown it on Noir Alley. I don't it wasn't on Noir that. Alley, no. But I know that it has shown on TCM. So uh, there is a possibility that that will come back around and I and I will show it. Yeah. Okay. and uh the night has a thousand eyes night has a thousand eyes is uh i'm working on it i hope i hope to show it in 2023 but i love that movie but it has not been confirmed okay. uh seconds uh seconds tough call tough call i love the movie uh it is now streaming on the Criterion channel as part of its uh, tribute to James Wong Howe. And I highly recommend everybody checking out all the movies in that uh, package. Really, really good stuff. Um, I don't know if I would show seconds on Noir Alley. I, you know, I've shown it right as part of Noir City. In a double feature with the Honeymoon Killers. And it was an afternoon. It was the second Sunday, which you are always have fantastic programming for that matinee because it's just sort of like you know how many people are going to show up because it's almost always the super bowl but that is one of my happiest <laughs> memories it's one of my most favorite double bills that you've ever done it's a, it's a pretty it. intense double bill and i'm I, a pretty intense person <laughs> you know, yeah. and I, I i did get some blowback on that one oh, man. from from some of the hardcore uh you know long time hardcore older fans who were like, don't do that again. Don't do that again. Uh, you know, they didn't like it because the movies were both from the 60s. And, you know, they were kind of cutting edge mm -hmm. for the time. Uh, and, you know, Seconds is just a, it's just a great film. It's fantastic. Movie. I love that movie. And I love Rock Hudson's performance in it. And there was actually interesting, uh, a, I think it was a TV biopic of him. 
And one of the my favorite scenes in that is a scene of him shooting that. Mm. And it's just like the, the thing when he's looking at his face and he's old and just to the, the yeah. Yeah, it's it's by far Rock Hudson's finest, you know. I mean, I, I love all those. In it. Love all the Douglas no, Sirk movies. Oh yeah, no, stuff. no, no. I do, I do too. And I but there's something so poignant, together. so poignant about him, and 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 also uh, John Randolph, who you know, who plays him. Yeah. In his initial incarnation in the movie is is also tremendous and the whole scene where he goes back to his house to see his wife you know it's like it's uh, so good yeah. anyway uh love the movie but i don't know that that i would show it i would i would love to host it on tcm but i don't know that i'd show it on noir alley i i you know it's one of those borderline films that's like there's a little bit of science fictiony stuff mm-hmm. going on in here yeah um and we'll we'll see. I'm, I never rule anything out. If I suddenly got an email saying, "Hey, you know, seconds is available in 2023," I'd probably say, "Got to introduce that." I, yeah. I, I, you know, very often I pick a film just because it's something I really want to talk about. You know. Yeah. No. Like a it, filmmaker or something, and you know, I'd love to talk about Rock Hudson and. James Wong Howe and how and how Frankenheimer cast all of those people in the movie who had been blacklisted. That was like one of the conscious things he did was put a bunch of people in that movie who hadn't worked in a long time, which I thought was really pretty cool. So yeah, and it really is. I mean, the great thing about it is it is sort of this has some sci fi element to it. It's this. But I just it's such a great film about aging. Yeah. I mean, it really is because it's really the core of the story. And oh my god, yeah, just you people need to watch it. Go get go get Criterion Channel and watch Seconds. Yeah, yeah, but it, it is very interesting because that that is a very noirish theme. You know, mm-hmm. is like he's trying to steal. It is like a heist movie. He's trying to steal back his youth. Mm-hmm. You know, and then he yeah. he falls in with the this crew that has a way of giving it to you, and then in a true noir fashion, you know, the moral of the story is you 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 don't get to go back. Yeah, you don't get to go back. You know, yeah. and yeah, I may end up watching that movie again tonight. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I can. Ted's coming over, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to. I'm still trying to get him to watch the Innkeepers. I just want to get him to watch T- Ty West Innkeepers because I found out that the guy who's hilarious in it is one of the two people working at this hotel that's closing down. Is the guy who played Jeff the cab driver in Better Call Saul? Oh, okay. And the the one that did it the most, not the initial guy, but the second guy. And it was like, and I saw him talking about it. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, he is. And the thing is, is I loved his performance in this movie. And I had like no idea that it was the same guy. Yeah, I was, I was, um, I was disappointed to see that uh, Ray Seahorn did not win an Emmy. But then again, uh, they didn't win any Emmys. They just win a single I, they didn't win any Emmys. I, I don't it, understand it doesn't be, because none of it makes any sense because I I watched the Emmys for 15 or 20 minutes and then I turned it off and I just said this is idiotic this holds no interest for me whatsoever and the idea that you're giving awards to there's no way to decide who gave a better performance as well it's just it, it's it's absurd the whole thing is absurd so Yes, you know, this is going back to my thing I mentioned earlier, and then and then we'll bring this in for a landing. Yeah. Is um, like, I just don't have time anymore. If I don't like something, I'm I'm quitting. I'm quitting. That's it. It's for young people. I remember when I was, you know, when I was younger. It's like I watch any movie, I'll read any book till the end. I'll watch any movie till the end. And now it's just like, oh man, I got I got other stuff to do. Yeah. I can't do this. What was the last movie that you gave up on? You just said, I'm not watching this. Um, God, I can't remember. I'm pretty careful about what I pick because I have really limited time to watch stuff. So I'm super like, it's very rare for me to pick something to watch that I don't like. You know what I mean? Like I'm just at the point mm-hmm. now where I can really like, and sometimes too, I don't really know that much about it. But like I said, 
there's all these YouTube commentators and stuff. So I went and saw Barbarian. That was the second film I watched. So the first of the two films I watched last night. And I purposely didn't, I walked in really blind and it had so many turns that I was so glad I didn't read anything about it. Yeah, I just, yeah. It, yeah, you know, I was like, there's enough of buzz about the people. And that's the other thing too, is I've really learned like, for which types of films who you should listen to <laughs> because mm -hmm. mainstream critics suck about horror. They don't like the genre. They don't understand it. They're, it's like, you, you can't even, you know, be bothered with that. Like you just have to dismiss it. And then I also follow directors and writers and actors too. So, I mean, I think that's part of it, but yeah, but TV series, I, I quit. I've had several TV series. Oh yeah, I just, I, just I, like I, I got into a certain point and I was like, very, very where, easy yeah. for me to give up, which, yeah. which means when you stick all the way, you know, when you watch every episode of Breaking Bad and every episode of Better Call Saul and all that stuff, I mean, that just speaks to how really great these shows are because so many series are like, I do two, two episodes and it's like, I, I get it. I'm done. I don't need to watch another eight episodes this year um, and then it's season one of four it's like oh my god yeah i'll tell you the one just to go out on a high note here um kath and i tried to watch um elvis the other night yeah right, the baz lurman film i barely made it to 20 minutes and, and just gave up i just yeah. I, I i cannot do this i just cannot do this it just it so rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah. Just everything about it was just like, oh no, not oh god no, oh no. And I know the guy was acting his ass off. He gives a really good performance in the film, but I just did not like the way the movie was made. I it felt so airless and stagey and and so incredibly contrived, and I I just didn't like it at all. Yeah, I'm going to rewatch because someone bought me a copy of it, but um, John Carpenter directed the TV movie of Elvis with Kurt Russell, which is the thing that, yeah. changed, that got Kurt Russell into being an adult actor, which... Right, right. Like, I, I, saw I, the, I saw it. I remember seeing it. It was good. It's really good. So that, you know, something, I'm going to rewatch that because, you know, I'm just really interested in seeing it again because I remember seeing it when it aired and I remember being really... It, it was really good. So I thought, yeah, I'm just going to, I think I'd rather just rewatch that. So someone gave me a copy of it and yeah, I haven't seen yeah. it in a while. And, you know, I wasn't, and also when I saw it, I wasn't, you know, a Carpenter fan. So it'll be interesting to go back and kind of see it from that lens. And also I just think because I found it so moving when Carpenter and Russell, you know, when I saw them together, I escaped from New York at mm -hmm. CCM festival, just the credit that Kurt Russell gave to him about, you know, what he did for his career, mm -hmm. you know, so I guess anyway, so I think I'd rather watch that. And Baz Luhrmann, I just like, I, I, I like Strictly Ballroom. I know I do this all the time. I always like the guy's first film, but sometimes the other stuff after that, I just never really cared for as much. Yeah, I just, it. it I hated I, Moulin Rouge. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not really saying the guy's a horrendous filmmaker or anything. Yeah, I'm just saying filmmaker. this just didn't, it did not work for me it just did not uh push the buttons that i need to have pushed when i'm watching a movie i just mm -hmm. felt like uh you know it's interesting i use a very simple way to describe how people make movies this is the most simplistic thing i can think of but i find it's much more enjoyable when you feel like you're being pulled through a movie like the director ha is this, you know, they have such command that they just pull you through and whatever they're doing, they're just pulling you right along with them and you're happily going along as opposed to directors who push you through the movie. Like they're just shoving you to see this and shoving you this way and that way. And it's like, you never feel like it's like you're going willfully on your own. And you know what I mean? Yeah, but yeah. By, when I say pulled through, I mean, because you're like in it. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is great. I'm following. I'm following. I'm so totally into this as opposed to just shoving you along. And I felt like with Elvis, I was just getting shoved every which way, you know, 
it's like, oh my God, enough already. You know, it, there was like more going on in the first 15 minutes of that movie than you get in an hour long movie. And to me, that's not necessarily a good thing. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that's that. Yeah. No, I liked, yeah, I like a, a fisherman. You know, <laughs> they put out the lure and you keep falling that. Oh, you just absolutely. Really absolutely. want to know what's going to happen, you know, and I love that. And it's just like you want more and more. And you want you want to know how things are going to wind up. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so we we are done with this one. Yes. It's weird. Uh, something just came up on my computer screen about Street of Chance, nineteen forty two, on YouTube. I shouldn't be advertising that because I don't think that's a legal upload of that movie. I don't think so either. <laughs> please, please don't watch illegally uploaded movies on. No, on don't YouTube. don't do please, that. Please. Don't do that. Okay, so no. pretend I didn't say anything. Okay, I will. And it was good to see. I think uh, I think that your cats traded places. I think they're trying to do like a like the Siad Mac film. They're they're yeah. tricking you. Because I'm pretty sure that's Emily now. Okay, so it started out as Charlotte, and then they they pulled a fast one, and then Emily snuck in. Exactly. Okay. In traded well, places. Um, okay, so to, be up to no good. Tomorrow you will be at the Redford Theater in Detroit for North City Detroit. So that's okay. that's tomorrow. So if you guys are in the Detroit area, please come out. Um, we still have uh, DC. To look DC forward is to coming as well. up, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, yeah. when is that? October fourteenth or something? 14th, I think it starts. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's around your birthday, I think. Very close. I yeah. will be. I will be there for my birthday. Correct. Yeah, because my mother's birthday tends to, and Brendan's birthday both are are usually during our North City in San Francisco. <laughs> and then, of course, there's the uh, the TCM cruise for those of you who yes. want to go on a cruise. I mean, I shouldn't be. You know promoting tcm stuff here on our channel but uh i i don't even remember the days i think it's november 11th to something um but i will be on that cruise and and uh, who knows what's going to happen it's it's craziness but yeah. we'll find out we'll find out you know pat boone pat boone is going on the cruise and i wanted them to show his noir film you know the pat boone made kind of a noir film called the yellow canary yeah it's based on a Whit Masterson novel, right? Okay. Uh, and screenplay by Rod Serling. Oh, wow. And directed by Buzz Kulik, who's a really good director. And uh, yeah, Pat Boone and Barbara Eden plays his wife. And uh, Jesse White plays his, he's a, he's a nasty nightclub singer. Yeah. Ooh. Or not a he's like a pop star. He's like yeah. he basically plays Pat Boone if Pat Boone was a really, really rotten person. Oh, he probably really enjoyed doing that, I bet. Yeah, he I understand that he asked if the film could be shown on the cruise, but <laughs> this work. may be a this may be a job for the Film Noir Foundation because there apparently there was no print oh. or digital version of the film available. So, I mean, God, that I, must have been so much fun for him to do. Yeah, I, did you know what I mean? Because he was so, oh. Oh, yeah, yeah cause he was yeah, just, he was you know, the perfect goody two-shoes guy, and he's just the sleazeball in this oh. movie. It's, oh, it's good, so there you oh, go. Oh, God, I, I want that one now. <laughs> okay, well, Anne, until, uh, until next time, this was great fun. Yes. Uh, it's good to see you. I'm glad you recovered for your gum, your gum surgery. Yes. Now go Thank feed you. those cats. Yes, and I'm going to eat solid food. <laughs> Yay. that's always good that's yes. always good okay and thank you everybody for watching thank uh, you. and thanks for all the questions and keep them coming we've got plenty more where these came from see you later okay. good night everybody bye